Hello, everybody. Welcome to another exciting, expeditious, hair-raised, fun-filled episode of Radio Rama, where I show you, as the name implies, how to work on radios. And today we have a 1960 Grundig model, 3160 AM, FM, long wave, short wave radio with a pickup slash tape recorder input. And there's a lot of things wrong with this set. Number one, you can't turn it off. I'm having to hold the off button down. Actually, never mind. It seemed like maybe it held that time. Well, let's see what it does. Um, I'm interested because there's a resistor taped to the top. It doesn't have an antenna, but it seems to be wanting to pick up stuff. The uh, this is typical. This this is typical for German sets. These piano switches are very susceptible to getting dirt down in them, which messes up the contacts. Okay, it does turn off. So probably I just need to clean the contacts on the on off switch. Let's open up the back and see what's going on with it. All right, opening up the back here, we have. Very typical design. It's a, let's see, four, five, six. And if you include the I tube, it's a seven tube set. Um, now, the rectifier is solid state in this guy, so technically it's an eight tube equivalent radio. However, what's interesting is that in Germany, for example, you were taxed on the number of tubes that your set had. And so to get around that, a lot of times the tubes they would employ would have multiple sections, as in two to three sections each. So that'd be the equivalent of having several tubes in one so that you could get away with having a lower tax rate and getting the performance of a higher count, higher tube count set. It's got a pretty big, beefy speaker, speaker, <laughs> speaker here. And uh, it looks like it does have a fuse, which is good to see. And it's been worked on. This is not original. That's an American fuse. And it looks pretty clean, actually. There's a lot of people, a.k.a. Ameri AKA Americans, who are scared of working on these for some reason because they feel that they're way more complicated they're really not. They are just a different flavor of manufacturing. They have their own weird quirks. It's no different than if you were a European working on an American set. You might not be as familiar with it because there weren't as many sold in your respective country, but they all use the same general circuit designs. You have the circuits for AM and FM and shortwave, and then, of course, you have your typical electronics inside your rectifiers and diodes and blah, blah, blah. If you can read a schematic, then you can fix a European radio. No problem. I've been working on these for years. And they definitely have their pain in the ass um, attributes. Like, like I said, the contacts are very prone to getting dirty and thus will malfunction. I also find that sometimes these are built in layers where you need to really dig down into the electronics and the massive wires to get at things as in they weren't really i think the the key difference and i'm I'm really generalizing here and you know you can bash my statements i'm about to make but in my opinion a lot of german sets were not engineered to be as user well as service friendly you get a lot of American and Japanese sets, they were engineered to be easily taken apart and serviced. For example, on an American set, your speaker connections would be plugged in, and you could just unplug the speaker. On the German sets, you have to unsolder these four wires and remember where they go. And um, so they can be kind of a pain in the ass, but you know it is what it is. It's fine. When they do get serviced, they do tend to sound really good. Um, I've had heard some theories as to why a lot of um, Germans back in this time period might have been more likely to have an apartment 
And so the idea of having something that sounded big and good, but in a smaller package was more advantageous versus when the U.S. where we overdo everything and have giant everything, including stereos as large as a car. So it's they're really efficient as far as their audio output stages. They use really good speakers. And uh, so they, they do sound really good. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and start disassembling the chassis. That's going to involve removing these wires. And uh, this is for the tweeters. And then this is for the, the base speaker here. And I believe that's it. You There's four or five bolts underneath, and this whole thing will come out with the glass front. All comes out in one piece. And then we'll take a look underneath and see what's been done to it. I get a feeling that probably used to be that resistor. The, uh, some of these wire wound resistors I find are not very reliable, so I'm not surprised that that has possibly been replaced. All right, so we got the chassis out. wasn't too bad. Sometimes they'll stick because the rubber grommets that are underneath the screws will kind of like glue themselves to the cabinet. You just like, use a little screwdriver and prime up. Let's flip her over. It's got a plastic dial, so I'm not worried as much about breaking it. Usually I find with these guys it's easiest just to turn them over like this. Oh, oh not like that though. And uh, let's see. This is the electrolytic capacitor. It has three values, a 4 microfarad, a 50, and a 50 microfarad. Electrolytic chassis is ground. It has a power transformer. Here is that switch, and I get a feeling what happened is that there was just some gunk that had built up in there that had solidified for not being used that much. And now seems to be going up and down a lot easier. I'll probably just squirt it out with some contact cleaner to make sure. This has got much better volume pots. A lot of these have volume pots that are completely sealed up and you can't get cleaner into them. These you can because you've got these slots there. That's great. These papery looking things, those are paper caps. They have the chalky looking ends. Those go just as bad as their American counterparts. But on the other hand, when you see these guys, these clear ones, those are polystyrene, and those are fine. Just leave those alone. But we have a decent amount of paper caps in here. We have one, two, big guy up here, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And there's probably one up top, so probably about twelve capacitors total. Oh, there's one underneath there. 13. See if there's any on the outside. No, there is not. What we're going to do is start with the electrolytic capacitors. You don't have to start with those. It's just it's what I do. It's just a habit. And what I tend to do is mount them over on the back side here, attaching the negatives to the, um, the chassis. That said, I, if I have... Let's see, where are our positives? If I have one that just has one value on it, or one lead, sometimes you can relocate your negative. Because again, all of the chassis is ground, so you can ground your caps, your electrolytic caps, anywhere on this chassis. But I'm not sure if I have room here. So first things first, I'm going to replace those three electrolytic capacitors. And maybe while I'm at it, a few of the caps that are lingering on around here. And then clean some of these contacts up. And, you know, lubricate that switch. And then do a test to see if we've restored, stored it to actual better functionality. I think it functions now. There's just a few basic things wrong with it. Okay, so the three electrolytics are replaced. Two are located here. One is located here. And now I'm going to use some deoxid. I'm almost out of this stuff to clean some of the contacts. You don't need much of it. Yeah, this stuff's expensive, unfortunately. Luckily, the museum buys it. I don't buy it. I'm just going to dribble a lot on these contacts. Then I'm going to flip it upright and get the top of the contacts as well. Can okay, we get the top of the contacts here the best I can? Yeah, it's just about out. How annoying. 
time to get another can. All right. Don't be afraid to use a whole lot of it. We're just gonna flush all that out and then work the controls. That tone switch is getting stuck. That was my wife sneezing. All right, it's time to give it a test fire to see if we're up and running. Make sure it's turned down all the way. Got a little antenna wire connected. Whoops. Yeah, it's on FM. All right. I hear nothing. Hmm. It's actually working worse. <laughs> That's not good. Hmm, what's going on here? No radio reception. Let me try connecting the antenna wire in a different place. Interesting. That switch is still dirty. All right, so I need to clean those switches more. All right, got some improvement. Still pretty dirty. I'll still need to clean up these contacts a little bit. I think I've got some dust bunnies in the tuning condenser. Okay, next up we're going to replace all of these paper caps. They have their values written on them. For example, this says 0 0.022 at 250 volts. You want to replace like with like or stay within 20% of that rating. And what I do is I replace one end at a time, solder in one end of the new cap, do the same on the other side. So we'll clean all these guys out of here, and I'll do another test to make sure we're still firing on all cylinders. All right, so all the capacitimitators imitators have been replaced. You just gotta take your time on these things. And uh, yeah, some of it's really buried. And one of my secret things that I use is retired operating tools. In fact, my dad has a friend who uh, is a surgeon, and these they're not allowed to keep these tools very long. So, of course, they've been autoclaved and everything, but they're, they're quite handy for getting down in the tight spots. So, one thing I noticed while I was recapping is that the volume pot is loose. So, I need to take this front plate off and tighten the bolt on that, otherwise it's just going to work itself loose completely. Okay, so I removed the knobs and the front glass, even though it's actually plexiglass and was able to tighten up the volume knob with this nut and since I have this all up I can clean all the dust bunnies and crap off of the uh, the back here and also clean the glass and I also want to lubricate all of the little pulleys and stuff that are attached to the tuning mechanism make sure that's all cleaned up and we can also get at the volume pot easier there's actually a push-pull switch in here too that activates a ferrite rod in case you want to use that instead of a line antenna Okay, so now I'm going to oil everything so it's going to move a lot nicer. Just a little bit of zoom spout oil here and there, everywhere. <laughs> Make sure and get just touch your little pulleys with a little tiny bit of it. Don't need much, like I said. Very dainty, very light touch. Let me get a little around the volume control too. So that will start to work in a lot more nicely. That already feels a lot better. Work the switch back and forth. 
Oh yeah, there's other bearings you need to oil, including this bearing. And this bearing surface here. And this bearing here. And then the outside of this bearing here. And that should gradually start turning a lot more nicely. It's interesting, this does not seem to be moving that much. It's supposed to be jumping back and forth. Let me take a look underneath and see what the clutch mechanism is doing. All right, so I figured out what was going on with the clutch mechanism. So basically you see, here's FM, and the clutch plate engages with that plate surface, and then we need to go to FM or AM switches. These two pulleys were frozen, so I'd leave them up. So now these two operate the way they should. You have FM operating independently, shortwave and broadcast operating independently. And now the oil's all worked in, it's behaving the way that you want, which is it's got a very light touch and the counterweight kind of gives it a nice slow, kind of hard to describe. It's a nice feeling. It's a nice little, I don't know, textural thing, I guess you could say. But now that we've got all of that taken care of, I'm going to clean the, uh, the face plate. Depending on how dirty it is, I may have to use some plastic polish. And uh, then we're going to test the set to see if we've got improvement, which I think we should. Okay, so now we're going to add the audio input feature that involves putting a 3.5 millimeter stereo cable through the existing tape player hookup, which according to the schematic is pins number 3 and 2, which is this and this. And we'll run right and left channels through a pair of 33 ohm resistors so that we can get true mono. I'll drill a small hole here and put a little rubber grommet, tie a knot in the cord so it doesn't chafe. I've been buying uh, these grommet kits at Harbor Freight lately. They work pretty well. And then, uh, electrically, the set will be mostly complete and we can test it out, and then it'll be time to work on cosmetics, cabinet, etc. What I'm also doing right now is soaking the knobs in warm water and a little bit of ammonia. It gets all the nasty hand prints and finger grime off of them. Okay, so the audio inputs run through our two resistors. And we got our ground here. Do not do this style of wiring of audio input devices on hot chassis sets, because you're asking for trouble if you do that. This happens to have a transformer, so everything's electrically isolated, so I can do it directly. Otherwise, if it's a hot or a floating hot chassis, you need to use an isolation transformer. No ifs or buts about it. And uh, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, when it comes to something that's potentially electrically hazardous, ask somebody that does until you figure it out. Or have someone do it for you if you don't feel comfortable. Um, again, I show you how to do these videos, but there's there always is a little bit of a risk uh, when it comes to working on vintage electronics. Just be aware of those risks and uh, pay attention to what you're doing. So now that the set is electrically overhauled, I'm going to test it out in the... In the uh, hook it up to the speaker and if we've got good performance then I'm gonna uh, move over to the cabinet and start working on it. I got, got the system hooked up and running my Bluetooth through the tape player pickup. Sounds pretty good. Let's try FM. Alright, let's try AM. First Lady Dr. Joel Buck. Ash, I'm downloading the free upside. We'll keep her there. This is coming up. Something to keep an eye on right now. Neither team is addressing it with different cleats or anything, but I'll keep an eye on it for you. Yeah, the first couple of years of this game, it was really coming up. So I got some dirt in the volume control, so I need to clean that up a little bit. Otherwise, I think we're good to go electrically. 
now it's time to start working on the cabinet which has a lot of da nasty looking crazing plus they, someone had taped this to the cabinet so I soaked the tape in WD-40 so that would come off and not take the finish with it don't ever do that don't ever stick tape on anything like that because then it just makes a horrible mess okay next stage of the project is we're going to work on this cabinet and you can see they put this very heavy plastic finish on it and when it's in the sun it tends to crack so we're going to fill in those cracks with light old english this will hopefully make all of that disappear yep see those nasty looking cracks are getting filled in with oil and then we will polish that up with Caranuba paste wax because these came with a piano finish like a mirror from the factory so you can see what a huge improvement that makes we'll go over the whole thing just like that let it soak in and then I'll get at my orbital polishing machine so it can bring back the shine okay next step is going to be polishing the case and this finish is tough it's basically plastic in fact when they advertised this finish they would say you could put a cigarette out on it and it wouldn't burn the finish so it's tough so I'm gonna actually use a plastic polish first and this is the best thing I've discovered recently it saves my hands apply it with this stuff instead of giving myself premature arthritis and I just want to take it slow if, the problem with I found with this thing if you go at this speed it's fine you go at this speed it flings polish all over everything including you so just be aware of it take your time all right this is after the first pass of the buffer and you can see what a dramatic difference that makes as I mentioned these were supposed to come with a mirror gloss finish so I think I'm gonna give it one more pass I also did the plastic dowel cover so that's looking pretty good I also took them gotten the knobs out I need to buff these up too but they're a lot cleaner all the uh, finger crap that was in these little grooves is cleaned out so one again one more pass with the buffer and uh, then we will uh, wrap up with the knobs and then it's time to start doing some reassembly all right so the second pass of the buffer is complete and you can see just how shiny that is it's like a mirror that's how it's supposed to have looked from the factory and it's the small details like that that make your set be from ordinary and regular to stunning likewise also polished up the knobs these are looking a lot better and so now it's time to start reassembling the set before i do i'm going to clean out the interior do i need to do that no but i like doing it because the set's been on the planet for 60 years I might as well give it a complete bath well i thought it was in the home stretch and unfortunately all is not well in radio land sounds like we have some interference not interference but there's some strange things going on with the speaker Sounds like the speaker is rubbing. That's really annoying. So I'm going to take the speaker out of the cabinet and see what's going on with it. I'm hoping maybe there's just something bouncing around inside of it. Otherwise, we probably have a deformed, potentially deformed uh, field coil. Well, not field coil, but voice coil going around the uh, the rod and it's probably been out of shape that's what's called in that rattling sound I think I might have found the problem this uses some very early foam rubber and the rubber part is no longer rubbery it's rock hard so little bits and pieces of foam have worked their way down into that um, voice coil area and so I need to clean all that out of there I'm not sure if you can pick this up but you can kind of hear that the little foam granules down granules down in there So what I'm going to do is get some pieces of typewriting paper and uh, see if I can shim it around there and pull that crap out of there. Well, I couldn't get the shims of paper down into the coil, so what I'm going to do is something I'm just guessing might work. I'm going to face the speaker down, and because the little granulars, granules of foam rubber are not magnetic, I'm hoping if I have it facing down like this and I put on a super bassy song, that it'll eventually fall out from underneath. Okay, so I played a lot of obnoxious bassy music. It seems to have gotten most of the weird distortion noise out. I think a lot of the foam bits have worked their way out of the coil. 
I'm still not totally happy with it, but I'm going to play it for just a little bit longer. If I can't get it to work right, I'll go grab another speaker. I have returned from the museum on a speaker hunt, and nothing we had would fit. The closest I have is this one, and I'm going to make it fit by drilling new holes. What I did is I blotted these screws with uh, ink, and I rubbed the front of the speaker on them, and I marked it. This may or may not work. We'll see. All right, my jury-rigged solution was I basically drilled new holes to fit the new speaker. It is actually also a Grundig speaker. I think it probably came out of a console radio because it's a little bit bigger and a little bit deeper. Everything just fit by a hair. Like the, the chassis fit barely underneath it. Um, it the result is it actually sounds better than probably what it sounded with the original speaker. It's a little bit deeper bass. I'll probably keep that other speaker just in case maybe I can rejuvenate it at some point. But uh, I still had some static. And it turned out that, again, one of the push button switches was a little dirty. So I just exercised it a little bit. The last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add the grounding cable that comes off of the audio input. That can easily be done just by bolting this in and loosening the bottom. And then I'm going to put this guy to bed. It'll be done. All right, after much trial and tribulation, the set is now back together again. I had one last hiccup where the way that the cord came out of the back for the audio cable, the back wouldn't go on. So I had to relocate the cable coming out of a different hole that I had to drill. But now it's all back together again. And um, it actually sounds really good, I think, because it's got a slightly bigger speaker than it was supposed to come with. It's got a good, rich sound to it. As when you were here. Anyway, let's go over to FM and it seems like it doesn't want to work, actually. That's really? Don't do this to me. Oh, we've still got some problems. Crap. Okay, so the problem was this little plate that holds the dial glass had gotten slightly bent. It's I can't film this because it's behind a bunch of layers, but you see that thing sliding back and forth? It was running into that, so I had to bend it up just ever so slightly. Now, I think this uses an ECC85 tube for the FM discriminator, discriminator, and those tend to get, for some reason, cathode poisoning in these tubes, so maybe it was on the way out, or it could just be loose. We can try it out and see. Let me turn it on. Uh, as he dumps more stuff in the floor. All right. I think this is probably ECC 85. Interesting. Getting no FM. AM, of course, works perfectly. Uh, poke a few more things up here. Nope. Nope. Well, I guess it's time to test that tube, see if it's actually gone bad. Bingo, found the problem. I don't know how I did this, but this wire came loose from this RF transformer. So, of course, it's not going to work. So, let me solder that back on there. Try it before I put all 10,000 screws in the bottom of this again, and hopefully we'll be good to go after that. Okay, that was a false start. Let's try this again. So, we got Bluetooth, and we have FM. Bad habits lead to you. I just wanna be 
and a.m. Welcome to the Bloomberg Business. My computer career in BIN 910. I'm Natasha Williams. All right, so. Charmed all the wayside. She's firing on all cylinders. There's no dispute. I just contradicted myself. My wife just a few minutes ago was asking, why am I calling the radio's guys? And I just said, well, it looks like she's firing on all cylinders, so whatever. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to let it play her for a few hours to make sure nothing's going to thermally break down from being inside of a warm, hot case full of tubes. And if nothing happens in a few hours, then I deem it done. But as far as this video, it is now officially completed. Thanks so much for watching. I always appreciate all of you who tune in. If you have any questions or comments, I'll try to get to them down below in the comments section. Until the next time that radio comes across my workbench, see you guys next time. Adios.